So I would say I'd hand over to, to Rob and his interviewer, but interview on the phone. On the phone. So I'll hand over to ladies and gentlemen, our guest for today. Stephen Moffat, who wrote me to Child and came up with that catchphrase, is every day he emails me asking me to go on to various sites and buy them because he wants everyone in the world to be wearing our oh, My Mummy t-shirt. He has no shame at all. He's just so smug about it. We would, have, we would have been quite happy except the BBC told the guy who was making oh, I know. not to. That, that's the BBC for you. If Steve finds another source or, or can find a, a way of getting hold of them, we have quite a lot of interesting people. <laughs> oh, actually, he sent me this link, and apparently there is a shop now online just selling um, Are You My Mummy teddy bears. Oh. And, oh. Uh, I think the oh. teddy, teddy bears come with gags and things. So there's an only teddy bear which says Are You My Mummy, they've obviously adapted from a children's range. They made it very Doctor Doo-ish, and it's, see that, that, that'll soon be stopped. Did Matt see one yesterday? I'm sure I saw a teddy bear with a gas mask on. He's so smug about it. What? <laughs> he's, he's got more catch of merchandise than anyone could possibly imagine. To. He's so annoying. But never mind. Anyway, yes. Rob Stephen, over to you. Right. Yes. Hello. So, um, writer tend to be quite anonymous. Yes. So, tell us something about him. Other than your Doctor Who credentials, what else have you done? Well, um, I'm really a writer of uh, comedy. I, I, I write a lot of theatre. I write a lot of radio. I, I wrote theatre pretty much because for about 10 years. I wrote for uh, um, Alan Athorn, quite a lot in Scarborough, and I still do like it. My first ever bit of theatre was actually in Plymouth, um, <coughs> back in 1992, the Plymouth Theatre World, where Roger Redfarns, who at that time was the director, got a couple of my plays to be sort of tried out there, uh, with David Collins in the cast. And I learned something on that first day of rehearsal, which I've carried forward. Just if you go up to any of your actors that you're working with and give them all their Doctor Who credits and tell them they were forced and eventually decided them. they had never had any respect for you again for the rest of the entire run. So, <laughs> so I mean, nowadays, I mean, if I'm working with somebody, I worked with somebody recently in Scarborough who I knew was Chang in the Wheel in Space. I didn't tell him that until six weeks in because I thought that on the first day it's a bit too much. So every time I would, I would go along and, and work with some theatre people, there would be someone in the cast I knew was a bit part in some Patrick Troughton series. So I, I did that. I, I, I was just a writer at the Northwood in Exeter for a couple of years. I went to university there and just stayed living there and got caught up in that. And I just stayed in theatre really for ages until eventually um, I thought it'd be nice to have some money. <laughs> <laughs> TV pays rather better. And I was getting a lot of BBC radio work at the time with Martin Jarvis. And um, Thanks actually in some ways to Stephen Moffat, who had heard some of my big Finnish audios for Doctor Who. He gave me, put me in touch with, touch with his wife, who runs Hartswood, who make shows like Men Behaving Badly and part of it. And uh, she asked me to write a series for me. And because I began to get into TV in a fairly high profile way, uh, and I was off my own series, I began writing on relatively new shows like Born and Relevant. And Doctor Who came along. I mean, Doctor Who came along very much out of the blue, I expected to call for my agent. So I, I'm not, I'm actually not done very much television at all, but it's all been pretty good stuff. I've been very, very lucky. I've avoided the whole East Enders world. Which is very good. So what series was it you wrote? Um, well, the one for, I've got my own. It, it still hasn't been made yet. Oh, um, right. I'm, I'm still writing it. It's called Loose Cannons, and it's a black comedy about battle being actors. And they're sexist. <laughs> 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 I gather there might be some people here who actually understand what that means. It's <laughs> my own sister. My, my sister's a very, very big War of the Roses fanatic, and I've been following her around for years going to the events. And it just is, it's just too good something, something to write about. It's just too good to pass off. And it, it's a fairly black, dark thing. I mean, it's going to be quite late night BBC 2 or let us know, because there's at least two or three people in the audience I know would love to watch that. Yeah. Well, you'll probably be scared of it. It's really warts and all. That's the final one. It's not the most So, yeah. So, I'm doing that at the moment, and that hopefully will be on the screen within a year. I've got to write another five episodes now. So, 
it's six hours worth of what we're So that's good fun. Yeah. I'm doing some more radio for the moment as well. But it's just, I mean, I'm always writing. It's, I'm just very, very lucky really, because I always wanted to be a writer. And if, um, I was thought I'd probably dry up, but I, I keep on getting you up and it's just terrific. And one day it probably will dry up. At the moment, I can keep going. So the nice thing about writing is you just keep writing. Yeah, Even that's right. Being paid for it, you just keep writing. Well, that's what I'll eventually do. I, mean, I think when people finally rumble me and realize I don't want yeah. to write them anymore, I'll just keep doing it in my little garage at home and just, you know, pretend and act them out myself in my bedroom. What about books? Yeah, books is difficult. I, I wrote a book. Many years ago, I was about 18 now, but it's rubbish. It's really rubbish. I've only seen it once since I got my author's copy. And it was a fairly academic book. I was asked to adapt someone's um, dissertation notes into a history book, and I did that. It was an old school teacher of mine. And I found it in the University Library in Exeter, maybe 10 years after I'd written it. And I found this copy of this book I've written, which has my name only on the inside because it's sort of ghost written. And it never ever been taken out. Um, <laughs> no one I know in the world has ever read my book, including me. I couldn't bother to read it as I was writing it. <laughs> so actually, it is probably the, the, the I think it was remained before it was even published. It was, it was also about 30 pounds. It was terribly expensive. No, no one would have bought it. And I've got a lot more experience in writing professionally. Yeah. I think novels are really hard, actually. I, I think there's a different. There are so many words in them. I know that sounds obvious, but, but scripts are very, very quick. You can write a script in about a week and a half. Um, even a two and a half an hour stage play, it takes about a couple of weeks at most to write a play. A novel seems to take about four, six, seven months. And I, I know that I've got so much self doubt when I'm actually writing. I mean, if I had to spend that much time with it. I probably give up partly through thinking, this is rubbish, I'm just being it. Um, I was asked by a Doctor Who novel recently um, at the BBC, but I, I was very tempted because I do love Doctor Who, but I haven't really got time for it, so I turned that down. But also because I just think I'd probably do it really, really badly. And um, I'd be very embarrassed if there was anything on the shelves with my name on it, which I knew was actually worse than anybody else's. So I passed on that. I mean, maybe one day I'll write a book. But at the moment, I'm just happy writing drama. How different is it writing for a comic strip? That was very difficult. I've never done that before. I may never do it again. It was, I just written a comic strip for Doctor Who magazine. I've written a full parter. And I wanted to be a one parter, but because of being on the new series, they wanted to really just sort of make this a big selling point. And I just kept on, I wrote it as I went along. I think you can probably tell. I don't really know what's happening in that strip, except I wanted to make sure that, because I write so much for radio and theatre, you don't write so visually. And it was a chance really to try and write something which every single page there'd be something very, very big and visual and a sort of strange image. And it was just getting all my sort of weird nightmare imagery out of my head. Not much of a story though, I thought. Um, it was fun to do. Uh, but incredibly hard work. I thought it'd be very easy. I thought, well, it's only got nine pages an issue. It took me maybe a couple of weeks per issue, and that's the length of the same for the entire stage play. So it was a lot of work, and I never quite knew what I was doing. But I think I was bailed out by Mike Collins, who... We know Mike. He's yeah. been a past So I gather, and, and he was great. I mean, Mike just solved everything. I mean, I would ask for things which were technically impossible, and say, well, We've written this panel here, which actually requires three complete changes of action. And, you know, we can't do that, because it's a, the whole point is it, it's a static picture model. I didn't realise. I mean, I don't understand pictures. So he would, he would sort of make, he would break it down like, much more helpful for me. I, I, I learned a lot by doing it. Also about how to write other things properly. About, because I waffle quite a bit. I don't know whether you can tell already. And, um, Therefore, my dialogue gets quite chatty because I try and make it sound a bit like me. But there's not room for dinner speech problems. I mean, if you want to write chatty bits of verbal diarrhea, you really don't want to do it in a comic strip. So they would sort of make me realise that every word has to count much more. So it, it, was, it was good fun, but um, scary. I'm quite glad it's over now. I'm quite glad that they're onto another comic strip because every month I'd get it, it was wins because. I'd be thinking, yeah, I wrote that, but I'm not quite sure that it worked. Yeah. I'd be
been asked back by them, by David Tennant more, but um, maybe. If it's something I actually have to work out better. I, I sort of wrote in so much in a rush, because I have to write around other things at the time, and I don't think I did it quite enough justice. I think if I could come with a good enough idea and actually break it down and know what my ending was before I started, <laughs> that might be a help. But that's my way. I mean, I never really know my endings. I, I never knew my endings doing big finish audios. I never knew my ending actually with the TV episode. I just wrote it and saw, saw what came out in the end. Which is how theatre usually works, because theatre is so open-ended. You, know, you write a bit of theatre and it's about... And you do do things up in the air and it's quite ambiguous. And it's not about climax, it's about people going like that in the end. Yeah, yes. Wistfully. And of course you don't really want wistful at the end of Dr. Who's story, so uh, you want things to blow up. So I'm sort of learning how to do that better now. But um, yeah, I might do it again. Maybe. If I can persuade my brain to actually work hard enough at it. So you never know. Yeah. Oh, um, I was a big fan of Alan's. Um, it's that sort of funny thing that everyone that I've been a fan of, I end up eventually writing for, which is really brilliant actually. Um, Alan, as you may know, runs a theatre in Scarborough which is devoted to new writing and, and to, you know, to actively exploring uh, the boundaries of theatre. You can do anything with Alan. I mean, Alan, I mean, uh, the first time I wrote for Alan was about, uh, it was a three hand, but only one of them um, was actually imaginary. So you'd have two people on stage talking to a third person who wasn't even there. Um, and that's very Alan Aitbornish. And Alan just likes to do plays where you, you mess around with lots of water and you have time travel and stuff. Because he loves science fiction as well. And um, Alan was, became aware of my work. He, I think his, his now wife had seen some of my play somewhere. And I had this phone call just saying, from Alan saying, so he sort of nods a lot. Mm, so uh, anyway, I'd like you to maybe write a play. And he, he never looks you in the eyes because he's such a shy man. He took me out for dinner and never looked at me once for the whole two hour meal. In fact, actually he said to me, before we ordered the food, he, he said, well, what did you do I pay for, um, for, for, for Scarborough? Uh, over August the 12th, September the 10th, they can close. Don't kill it about. He said, oh, bugger, I've nothing else to say to you now. We'll have an entire meal with you. I said, no, I'm oh, sorry, Alan. He said, no, no, it's all right, it's not, it's, it's my fault, it's, it's my problem, not, not yours. Maybe you could just talk to me or something, I don't know. But he was saying this dinner and I just talked at him. And then we went, and I've worked with him now for about 12 years since then. And he's always like that, you know, you go to Alan's house, and Alan will be in two, sort of two moods, and either race around like a small child to show you his latest PlayStation game, or he just won't really talk to you, because he doesn't quite know how to. He, he, like, he likes writing, he likes directing. The rest of it just seems like a, a bit of a baggage to him. So he just says, we, we know what you're doing, you just go away and write it, and then we'll put it on. And you go, okay, Alan, and off you go. And that's brilliant, it's also very, very scary. I mean, it means that situations arise that you give Scarborough a title, that's all they really ask for, it, it is a title. Which is why every play at that theatre, if you look at any of their brochures, sort of hand me down generic titles, because we never know really what they're writing. Um, and all my titles that I like are the things I um, uh, inappropriate behaviour, which means anything. I mean, just, or faulty or self I mean, What does that mean? It means nothing. It can be any, any play can be attached to that title. And then you see it in the brochure and you haven't even written it yet. And people give you phone calls and say, it's selling very well. It's so good. <laughs> um, and they say things like, um, what would you like for the post? You say, I don't know. If you, if you write, if you do it, maybe you'll give me an idea about what to write. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, and that really has happened once. I wrote the entire play based on the poster that was already selling for the show. And that was actually down down the, uh, the north of Texas, where I was, because I was based there for about two years, just writing non stop. And they would do maybe four or five plays of mine over that period in their, in their main kind of show. Uh, I got very, very behind, and they were advertising the shows well in advance that I hadn't even had an idea for it. So, um, and actually, there was one day I came in, and there was, because it was the Christmas show, there was a huge queue already queuing for it, which was wonderful, but I hadn't written a word. And I didn't even know what the cast size was at that point. And they sat me definitely quite falsely and said, 
we have all these actors, they would really like to know actually what it is they're doing. Could you maybe write it this, this weekend? And you say, yeah, right. and, and so you do. Um, but that's, but Alan loves that. I mean, I think also, because, particularly in television, where everything is finessed to such a huge degree, and you spend, I spent eight months writing Darling. Um, you spend maybe, it's so quick theatre, and Alan celebrates the idea that most writing is actually done very, very speedily, and because you need to do it. And that's fun. It sort of makes you play around with it much more. So, I mean, theatre's my, my favourite thing in the world, but TV is a bit, TV's very hard, so theatre's easy. Just do it, put it on, no one comes, you go home, it's great. <laughs> you get bad reviews, you go, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Jasper, um, I thoroughly enjoyed Dalek, but thank you. This is sort of a sort of general question I've got to you. Sure. Uh, yeah, bad yeah, yeah. Um, I never understood that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we weren't even told about it. I, I don't remember. It's very odd. You go to meetings with, 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 with Russell T. Davis and you'll say things like, Russell, you wouldn't believe they're saying online. You're going to cast Billy Piper. He says, good idea. <laughs> so he goes away and does it. And, which was actually extraordinary. I mean, I, I mean, I had real misgivings about that, but she was fantastic. And the Bad Wolf thing, um, Bad Wolf began pretty much when, I think, writing Aliens of London. He just put it in, and we, and we got the scripts, and we said, oh, right, that's a kid who just reveals on the target. So I thought that was the important thing, that this could be some sort of nonsense. And of course, then it began filming, and people on, I think, fans began taking photographs. And there were some, photo, there were some photo captures of this image of the TARDIS with bad wolf written on it. And I went to another, another meeting with Russell and I just said, you won't believe what they're doing now. They think bad wolf's important. And he said, <laughs> he said, actually, I, I don't know whether I should make it important. And I said, well, what would it be? He said, I don't know. Uh, is, there a bad, is there a place in your, we can put bad wolf in your episode? And I said, no. He said, I'll, I'll find one. And he did. And, I, I did. and actually, I didn't write it in, but that opening helicopter has bad wolf on it. Um, and by the end of the series, people write them in anyway. I remember Stephen Moffat trying to write the bad wolf things he could put into. <laughs> but we never knew why, and no one ever told us. I remember when I watched Parting of the Ways, I was thinking, great, so what is this bad wolf thing? Because I didn't know. And none of us knew until it went out. And then, still didn't necessarily know. <laughs> I, I don't quite understand it. I'm sure it's I'm sure it works out somehow. But that was actually the way it worked. I mean Doctor Who was it was actually it was, it was that very odd thing that we were it sounds awful to say, but we had no idea what we were doing. Yeah, mainly on that first series. We you know, you, you would go through meetings where they would suddenly say, Okay, well look, we're not really sure we can do death in that time scale. So Russell had written Rose, the first script that we greatly enjoyed. But the only one actually that we written when we all joined was, was Rose. You had that very, very quickly. And the stage directions do say, you know, when the, uh, the autons are attack, but no one dies on screen. Because we weren't really sure the BBC guidelines anymore were, because everything always changes. The, a lot of the shows that were made in the 70s, you would never show a comedy in the US in that time of because you just couldn't show that amount of violence. And so when I came to write Dalek, I didn't know what I was doing about death there either. I said, well, it's a Dalek, and I'm like, it's going to kill people. And they said, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Um, well, give it a go. And so I wrote my first draft, I think I needed about one body die, and that was off, and that was off screen. I said, oh, no, 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 you can put a lot more horror in, go on. So my second draft I went away, and I came up with this huge body. And the, it was actually that bit called the sucker, because that was a lot more violent as I actually wrote it. I just thought, well, I'll see how far I can go. Was, I was said, oh, just go as far as you want, and we'll, and we'll see if we can do it or not. So I had this sucker come out and get the guard, and it caught him by the face, and then the, the sort of black rubber of the sucker just grew like fingers and absorbed his head. And then, while he was still screaming, he was just suffocating with his sucker on him. He lifted him up, and it threw him around the walls a bit. And then he fell down the wall, and he saw that his face had burned. And Russell just looked at that and just said, 
What are you doing? <laughs> Why are you trying to ruin my show and get it cancelled? Start to see. No! <laughs> no, you can break his skull. I said, look, I'll do that. I think that's actually worse. And that, I mean, when, I, when that went out, I was horrified by how unpleasant that was. But, it, but it's a similar thing, though. I mean, we just didn't know how far to take those things. And Stephen Moffat first saw The Empty Child at my house. Um, the night of Dark going out, um, he brought on a video copy of the rough edit of Empty Child, which he hadn't dared watch on his own because he thought it might, he thought it might be awful. And he, well, he watched it therefore with, with a bunch of the people who worked on the show together, watching it on my video at midnight. And at the time that Richard Wilson's gas mask comes out of his mouth, Stephen just put it on pause and said, we've gone too far, haven't we? And we said, no, it's brilliant, it's great, it's brilliant. He said, no, no, I think we've gone too far, I can't show this to my kids now. And it was just, I mean, it's wrong, I think it's a great way, but it, and, and I think he now thinks it is as well, but it's that, it was that always, that, that sort of big worry from meeting to meeting, that we never entirely knew what, what was going to happen and what was in the air or not, and um, the whole bag of things like that. Russell thought during the season, oh, maybe we should do something which is like a sort of, a, a, a connecting thread, but it may not pay off, I don't know, and he just see if it did or not. And he just happened And of course, it, strangely, it, it began to get people excited. And as you know, we'd have things in the newspapers. But because we never thought Doctor Who would even be that successful, we thought Doctor Who was probably going to have one year and then get cancelled. And we just wanted to be as, as good as possible. We, we didn't want to kill it. It's one, of, it's one of the reasons why we never went off Earth. Because we were told at the BBC very early on, all right, well, you, well you've got this series. We're not that happy about you bringing it back, actually. It came out, sort of ain't vacancy announced it, but no one actually had really gone through the usual five-year taking procedure. She just wanted it back on the screen. I said, well, don't do any of those alien planets, because we'll just take it off. So Russell was in a situation where he had to try and make it a mass market show in a, in a slot which had died, because there were no family dramas at that time, hadn't been for years. And was told, but nothing of her, please, because that would just have people turning off. We don't want lots of silly aliens looking around on boys. So he had to sort of bring it back to Cardiff quite a bit, and that was pretty much the sort of commission grade. But that will probably change now, so we can have it if we want. It's been successful. So, so I just waffled on a bit. It's quite interesting and interesting. You go, you go on about the, on the skull thing, oh. but the biggest complaint I understand was the torture of the Dalek. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They did. Uh, and oddly enough, yeah. nobody complained about torture of the Doctor. No. <laughs> <laughs> actually, torture the Dalek. Actually, complaints. the one problem we, we did have the Mary White House's bunch, um, who told me very angry about two things before it went out. First, it was that I used the words canoodle and spoon. <laughs> well, I, and I had to, and, and the BBC give you a phone call, and, and, you, and you, if you go onto radio programs and TV programs, and they say, okay, clear the statement. And I said, well, I'm, obviously, I'm very sorry I used the word spoon. Um, I don't want children being corrupted by new children who tend to do you? And they said, well, this is terribly strong language, spoon and canoodle. And I thought, it's, it's, you see, it's, we can't, we didn't even do Oh, is it? Apparently, I mean, they were saying, well, spoon means things you may not know about. No, I mean, it's what I had in mind. Um, the other thing they had, though, was that the torture of the doctor, they said, was me mocking the crucifixion. So, because he had his arms up, that meant that I was saying that he was Christ. And I said, no, I just had his arms up, really. <coughs> That's really how we did it. It's like Joss already did that. Yeah. Well, so yeah, yeah, I mean, no, yeah, absolutely. Chris. Chris. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, you see, of course, that, sort of, that actually, that rather delights us. And he rather likes the, the controversy of that. But so before we actually went on, we had all this little problem about things which I just thought we would never have problems with. I thought we might have a problem with some of the violence. Um, but yeah, the, the, the problem was the British Porn Film Classification came back and gave us 12 because of the Dalek torture. Um, no, I mean, I mean, I take their point, actually. I mean, I mean maybe, well, the thing is, I thought the story's point was that we were saying the Doctor's instincts, therefore, were actually questionable anyway. I mean, that was what the story was about. And but the BBFC and certain psychiatrists I saw on television discussing it didn't seem to understand that the story actually developed from that point onwards. And I think that 
I mean, most children I've spoken to have watched the episode, found the Doctor quite frightening, and actually were on Rose's side, and actually bothered with the Dalek war. That was kind of the point of it. So, what we've done, what has been done with the story and made him. The Doctor has always been the hero. And in yeah. that one episode, so you saw the Doctor, which you started to see it early on. There was yeah. a different Doctor, and he was quite harsh. And this, and yeah, he was frightened. And you saw something in the Doctor we'd never seen before. The fact yeah. that he was willing to murder because he was afraid. So that was probably a big, one of the biggest shocks, I think. It came out of one real thing, actually. It came out of two things, to be honest. When I was, I remember years ago, Ted was dead, say. You know, that the Doctor was never cruel or casual, would never hurt anything, except regard for such a fair game, which is sort of half joke, he said. And I thought, well, why are they fair game? I mean, they're, they are creatures too. I mean, I'm not saying that a Dalek doesn't deserve to die in the story, because a Dalek is a, a thoroughly evil, unpleasant thing, obviously. But I still thought it was actually something that we should have some sort of... We should, we should, we should, actually, that, that whole dilemma should actually be beyond the screen at some point. Um, beyond Tom Baker at one point saying, do I have the right? The rest of the time you just see him happily going around going, oh, do I accept, do I accept, do I to rather enjoy it. Got John Pertwee at one point, I remember, blowing up the dive and saying, you know, I'd rather enjoy that. <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah, I mean, and, and that's fine, but I've no problem with him enjoying it. I wanted just to sort of say, well, at least this is his nemesis then we ought to actually represent that properly. And that was what the other sort of worry about it really, was that they asked me about the dykes in the first place. And discussing it with my wife, she thought the dykes were rather stupid. She's not a fan at all. And if they are his big nemesis, if we're, if we're trying to build up a doctor again from scratch, as we thought we had to do, because people didn't necessarily know who he was, we want this sort of all this, this hugely intelligent um, alien that he wants to spend time with. His, his enemy ought to be something which seems clever and conversational as well. And, yeah, and that's why they brought him the Master, of course, all those years ago, because he didn't have anything like that. But, but since we were saying that the Daleks were the ones who killed his, his home world and wiped out the time lords, we couldn't just have the Daleks being something which said nothing but what exterminate and my vision is in heaven. I mean, they can say that, and they do, but they ought actually to have some sort of sense of cunning to them. And, which is what the series did in the, in the beginning anyway, when all those Hartnell and Trouty guys, particularly the Trouty guys, I think the guys are fantastic in that. So it's just a matter of going back to that. Uh, it did become childish towards the end, and it was just, like, in my opinion, it was just starting to become smart writing again, so they cancelled it. Yeah, and now the, the new series is actually really smart writing. There's a lot of good stuff to think about there, some, some clever stuff. I think you'll enjoy season two more. Season two are better scripts than season one. Season one we didn't. I'm not writing the season two, but I have I have read some, and I think the season two is fantastic. There are certain things about the reason why I mean, David Tennant is far more forefront of the stories. Chris Eccleston. One of the reasons why Dark sort of came off the way it did was that Chris never saw Doctor Who at all. He never watched it, which is I think a, a big bonus in some ways for his performance. It meant that he always felt very, very uncomfortable taking the central position in the story. So he wanted to be someone who, who influenced events for, which Russell used so that you would have other people solving the story because of the Doctor's influence. David, though, was a big Doctor Who fan, was he doing the Tom Baker? So what you've got is in the scripts now, David Tennant's Doctor being very, very much more dynamic than this. When Chris got Dalek, he, I mean, bless him, he loved it because he had a chance to go and play a Doctor Who that was more um, tortured and more uh, damaged. And he just ran with it. I mean, I think that, I mean, I, sorry. He does damage so well. He does damage crazy well. It's that, it's that funny thing that, I mean, I remember writing it and didn't expect Chris to go so far with it. I mean, I, I thought it was crazy he did. But, you, but, but that first thing he has when he meets the Dalek, which of course he's just going, I will do that. I wrote that. If you, actually, if you just look at the words on the, on the page that you do in the overpriced group of the play, um, it's, it doesn't say anything, you know, that Chris goes mental and goes into the ice lord. It's simply that Chris ran with it. Chris just said, I will do it. I'm, I'm normally seeing the Doctor change that. You, you, 
you saw a kind of moment where, like you said, you saw the fear in his eyes. Yeah. And I think it's nice because everybody has their limits, no matter how heroic, how or whatever. I mean, I mean, I grew up with John Kirk with the Traction Patrick Brown, and he's an extreme sighting. Which is why I think Billy Piper did one thing, which he did so well. Oh, yeah. Because people didn't expect it, but there's that you saw in his eyes. And yeah. his whole composure, his whole, and he was, I, I don't think he was denying that part of himself. He, won, he, he justified it as being a tame justice for us to want to touch his shoe in the But he's the brilliant top critic. He had the one well. choice, he didn't have the one choice, and he had the time to be able to do that. I know, for example, if I gave that to Colin, yeah. and I had that, Colin will play the doctor in a doctorish way because he knows what the doctor should be. So you get that same scene in the auto and being rather the loop and saying, so, darling, you know. And Chris didn't know what that was. Chris didn't know what doctorish means. He'd never seen the show. He just said, well, he's going into the cell. Um, he's meeting, it's like the last Holocaust by the meeting his last torture. But now but he's going to go wild. And he just ran away. Every time he gave us a script, it's what I can make was so good. He never worried about how it made to Doctor Who in the past. He just said, well, this is how I just the script. And so it seems to have quite a lot more emotion from him, like um, Father's Day as well, which I know he really enjoyed. Anything which of Joe at home directed, because Joe allowed Chris that sort of free thing. Chris just enjoyed doing it. Chris just said, right, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to run with this. I think early on, I mean, Chris has said that um, and you'll probably say one day in an interview. He didn't feel very comfortable in the first block with Rose and Aliens in London. He wasn't quite sure what he saw, how to pitch it. So that he said, you know, he said to me at one point that if you see him in those sort of sequences where he's just sort of grinning and in, in the lift, and it's, it's an actor not knowing what the hell he's after. <laughs> so well, I, I don't know what I'm doing in that. Because I like that too, because in the way that was in the the big green, that I had a feeling that everyone was a subject rather than, but actually eventually came, you actually saw the doctors actually having some very deep feelings. I actually caring very much about, because at the start of it, I mean, oh, I love Chris Edwards and Smile. Yeah. I had a feeling that he was back to one and sat in the other, he was, he was playing the sightings, but we'll do this, that, and the other, might get that effect. And the fact that people go, ah, I, I, I'm think, still, it, yeah. 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 I think it works yeah. partly because you know <laughs> his backstory later yeah. on, is that he is this comes out, very, very damaged man, yeah. which is, one of the reasons why, it's, in some ways, although I really enjoy working with Chris, and I think Chris did so well, I'm really pleased that the whole season maps up the story. That yeah. Chris, and Chris was always, in some ways, intended to die in that season. I mean, that was. I mean, we always well, we're waiting to see if Chris would stay on or not. But Chris had said at the very beginning, "Well, I'll give it a year because that's what I can really afford." Mm -hmm. and, and I know that it was that situation at the very beginning that we thought, "Well," and I say we, but I really mean the people more important. You know, do we open Doctor Who with an act who might stay for a couple of years, but it may not survive a year anyway? Or do we open with the biggest actor we can get and the best actor we can get? We'll do it in this sort of blaze of glory and then we'll, and then we'll depart. And obviously the way you go is you say, well, it may only be a year. And it was right too. I mean, it was that funny thing at the BBC when we were working on it. The first few months we were doing it, I wrote a couple of drafts also of Dalek before Christmas comes. The BBC were very, yeah, Doctor Who's back. Well, I suppose that's going to be all right, maybe. I mean, we don't think it's going to work, but go off and do it. Once they cast Chris, oh, right, you've cast Chris Edmiston. And suddenly you actually consider the BBC being to think it was a big project. And by the time we got to, you know, obviously early this year when you had all the billboards, that would never have happened if we cast somebody that might have said, okay, well, I'm not a big name, but I'll do it for another three years. It just wouldn't have ever had got that publicity behind it, and it wouldn't, I think, have, have been successful. No, but as she wasn't a particular type of drama, he wasn't very well known. He was not known outside this country. I, I sort of mean big name in terms of reputation yeah. as the BBC. And the BBC were amazed we got for second. They, I mean, because, you know, I mean, you read all the tabloid press and you know, Every, every you know, Sun article or Daily article will say, oh, will it be Paul Daniels? <laughs> and that, of course, is the way we were thinking all those times. I mean, back in the 80s, um, no disrespect for anybody actually played the role, but every time the, the, the part was up for casting, that was always the story you'd get, isn't it? It's going to be, and then in the 90s, you know, is it going to be David Hasselhoff? Is it going to be, it wasn't ever going to be a sort of a very big 
back to winning actors. There was going to be somebody who was an entertainer. And Chris Eccleston's casting, I think, changed the perception of what Doctor Who was at the BBC. And it meant that we could sort of just really go away and write much more um, emotional character driven stuff. Because we knew that Chris would just really, really take that to the moment. It was a good choice to take somebody of that skill yeah. and to just give it a kickstart and then let somebody, if, if he didn't want to do it, let somebody prove to the BBC that it would work. Well, David is, I mean, David's going to be amazing. David is amazing. I mean, I've seen some of David's stuff already, as Dr. Who. And he's, and I think David's going to be, he's going to be such a huge star because of this. Because um, he's, he's one of the best actors in the world. He's not that well known in TV terms. Um, this is going to really, it's going to have a sort of Tom Baker quality, I think, of, of becoming defining. I think, I, th I think he will define the show in some ways, in the way that Chris is actually in some ways too too much of an act to do. But I think David is just going to run with the part so well. It'll be for Doctor Who, I'm sure, has raised Chris's profile outside the UK. Oh, I'm sure. Because yeah. I went to the States just after they announced who it was, and I was having people coming up to me and say, who is it? Is he any good? He's a really, really good actor. So now it's out into the international battle picking on the Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, Chris was, Chris's main concern was he wanted to do something which children would enjoy. Has he never done that before? He's such an earnest actor, and indeed going into every episode, he would always, he would actually ask the writers, because he's very, very writer-driven, because he'd say, you know, so, so what is the sort of real impulse behind this thing, can I say to sit down the whole thing? Right back to Rose, where he was trying to relate Rose to being about, and, and he's right, it isn't there, it's about Rose trying to escape from a humdrum, sort of self-fulfilling, um, depressing life in a council state. And end of the world, he said, well, that's about the dangers of um, cosmetic surgery. And he's always trying to find the issue. The issue is always the most important thing in Doctor as we know. But Chris was always needing to find what that serious impulse was, because well, what's it? otherwise, why, what's the point in doing it? And Chris is, and that, I mean, that is Chris. Chris took the show terribly seriously. And he worked so hard on it. Uh, it was actually quite heartbreaking in a way that, that, that Chris's departure was announced so badly. But, and, and Chris was heartbroken by it too, because Chris said, I mean, he emailed me afterwards and just said, the terrible thing is that I'm no longer the doctor now. I mean, I've had one week of being the doctor and now I'm, I'm the ex-doctor already. And I wanted to have the audience behind me. I wanted to sort of have that adventure with them. Because the idea was that they would never announce it. You know, Chris would, it would be a shock for the fact. And looking back, that seems now ridiculously naive of us, but we didn't think it would be a big hit. I mean, we thought it was going to be a middling show, and no one would really care. You know, why would the press want to write about the leaving of Chris? Now, of course, because Doctor Who is such a huge hit again, what, I think whatever we do, there will always be someone who will find out about it. But we thought we actually probably could, could, could do the show in total safety, and not out sort of EastEnders um, type of potential. If you have someone leaving EastEnders, it will be in the press immediately and they just write with it. But we thought we could actually do a situation where you can kill off Doctor Who and have it as a surprise on the screen. I think the problem is in the same, it's, it's our age group, we're, we're the yeah. ones responsible. Because we're the age group that are now in, in the echelons of the BBC who, who are saying, you know what would be a good idea, let's bring back Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, um, we're the ones that are now sort of in, in the right areas of management of various companies. And yeah. so, yeah, I, I know it might not seem like a good idea, but we're damn well going to work on this show. <laughs> Trust me. It's the thing about and it. It's yeah. also the same age group of the journalists and, yeah. and even the editors of the newspapers who are saying, look, I know you think it's a silly idea reporting on Doctor Who, but I'm going to tell you to. <laughs> well, that's the funny thing about it. I mean, I mean, we all went into it, and of course everybody working on the show has loved the show in the past. I mean, that, we're all the right age now, as you say. And every writer on the show, as it turns out, is a huge fan of it. But we all have our own series elsewhere. But we all wanted to take a year, like Mark Gatiss and Stephen Rother and Paul Cornell. I mean, we all came on it because you know, we would obviously want to be part of that, of trying to make the show work and try and give it its first, its first few steps again. But we all, but we couldn't really believe it was going to be down to the day. 
don't need it. Don't need anyone else. And, and we thought, well, well, we all love it, and we all feel proud of this, but we can't pretend that anyone, that, that actually the children are going to care. I mean, this is my big thing writing Dalek. I thought, well, it's fun we're writing a sort of big iconic monster, but what if they all prefer the Sylvain? I mean, the, the Sylvain are a bit more mobile, they've got better arms, and the Dalek is 40 years old. The farting jokes are fun. The farting jokes, the farting jokes are fun. Um, but it, it's, it, it's that, I mean, again, Ains London was actually written specifically because every story was written for a different reason. Um, we didn't know what our audience was. Ains London was written for the eight year olds because we thought at that stage, maybe that's all we've got. And other stories, we go, well, maybe we haven't got them either. Maybe we ought to try and write for... So every single story was trying in some ways to, to experiment with the reaction. We were expecting, in some episodes, they would say, yeah, that's what we want from Doctor Who, and not that. But actually, every week, we got the same sort of basic feedback, which is said, yeah, we like that one as well. <laughs> so we still have no template. I mean, it's that funny thing that, that Russell said, well, you know, maybe they'll, they'll hate the empty child, but they'll love the unquiet dead and then we'd know what to do. But because every single week we had a similar sort of reaction from everybody, which was, yeah, we like that one. So what's next week? We say, well, next week's a comedy. Is it? Okay, we'll watch that one as well. I think it's, it's not for own favourites. I think both probably for the people who were fond of the original series, yeah. the turning point probably was Darling. A lot of it seems That's how we felt, actually, strange. Unique and childish, and then it takes a sort of slightly more mature and dark tone. It, it was what we and although it was different, different, it was also familiar in the same sense. You know, here's the Doctor going up against the villain who's seen the face countless times. Yeah. And yet, the entire approach to the episode was different. Chris said that was the changing point for him, actually, was Dalek, because from that point on, he felt that he could actually expose the sort of grander story behind everything. You know, even if you would have lighter episodes like, like, like the long game afterwards, it was with that sort of memory behind it that his race was now wiped out and it, and it sort of gave us more to play with. I think Mark suffered the most of all of us doing the Unquiet Dead as episode three because, I mean, that has changed an awful lot. I mean, the episode that Mark had written originally was far more about, about grief. It was actually a much darker, more serious, and I think rather better episode, to be honest. But it was too early on in the series and Mark wanted to sort of play off the idea that, that his race were dead which had at that point been mentioned, we mentioned in the week before, but it was too early. And I was very lucky that Dalek came along and I was allowed to just go hell for leather with that. But, yeah, I mean, I think we all felt working on it that the second half of the series was a bit more, it just felt tighter to us. And we also began to work, I think, with better directors, which I shouldn't really say, but it's true. I mean, I think that James Hall was doing Empty Child, Joe heard on Dalek and on Father's Day, I think that they really that they really knew what they were doing, and, and also because they just loved it. Whereas Keith Boak, who was a perfectly nice chap on the first block, everyone was trying to find out how to do it, and it all felt a little bit, it didn't quite come off so well. So there wasn't the same urgency to it. I think now that, I think that the whole of last year was such a huge learning curve for the production team, which is why we were amazed it worked, because year two is so much better. And people look back on year one and they'll just go, it's rubbish that like, year compared to year two. I mean, next year is, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited by uh, season two. I mean, How much you have to bribe you to drop some hints? Um, not, not that much. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just us, it's yeah. just. Well, the thing about it which I've really noticed is that Russell's writing has become much more. I think he felt most comfortable when he wrote Bad Wolf and Parting of the Ways, ultimately. Because I think that early on, he was trying to find out... He was very worried when he wrote the first episode of the series that he had to try and make it appeal to that Anton Deck crowd. And I mean, he's, a big, he's a huge Doctor Who fan. He didn't actually necessarily want... I mean, he was very kind. He gave all the writers the sort of, the sort of big fan-friendly episodes. But he was doing the ones which weren't going to be so much. I think now he just says, well, hell of it, I, I can now write Doctor Who stuff. Tooth and Core, which is the, the Queen Victoria stuff, um, is, is so, it's a really good, scary, traditional Doctor Who horror story. And it's brilliant. And it's, and it's not that sort of, the thing which people, I think, find difficult with Russell stuff, which is, it's not that sort of nice, showy, contemporary, farting alien thing. 
about council houses. It's, it's a really good traditional Doctor Who scare story. The Cyberman two-parter is amazing. It could be the best Doctor Who story ever, ever told. I mean, it's only being made now by Graham Harper, which is why Nick isn't here this weekend, because he's off, he's off making it. Um, but it's brilliant. I mean, the Girl in the Fireplace, Moffat's second story, I prefer to Empty Child. I think it is, it's a lot funny, though. But it has some really genuinely scary moments which are going to make kids terrified. You know, it's things like, you know, you must not come to your bed because the monsters will get you. Um, which is something which will really freak them. Um, Mark's story, uh, which I can't tell you the title of yet because it keeps on changing, but it's, but the idea of that is just a really good, effectively scary story. I think that what they're doing now is they're saying, okay, well, what we learned from the series one is that we don't need to pander. Anything which felt like it was being watered down to try and make the audience feel they could take this show, we don't need to do it anymore because, because we never have had such a huge backing. Even in the, in, over the last 40 years, the BBC were never actually that behind it. It was successful, but they were sort of fairly disdainful of it. At this stage now, they can go away and they can say, OK, well, let's try and push back the boundaries a bit. So every story, I think, represents a real, a real high point. People really trying to make as good as they possibly can be. And to be as unnerving as they can be, which is quite odd. Um, David's loving it. I mean, in, in some ways, I think that the episode which is the most old series, like the first, the, the most, like this last year, is episode one, uh, New Earth, which is the return of Cassandra. And that one feels like it's a bit series one-ish. It's, it's good fun, but it's a lot funnier. But after that, it becomes a lot, it is, it is funny, because David is so good at comedy anyway, you'd be, you'd be mad not to use it. But it has that darker, more, Sort of darker Tom, early Tom Baker feel, which is what Russell loves anyway. But we didn't feel that you quite go with the gothic horror stuff that Tom did. Was yeah. It really, uh, it was, for me, that was one of the high points of Doctor Who because being scared, I watched The End of Child and it was the first time since The Reign of Morbius yeah. that I actually went, ooh. And the gas mask yeah. came yeah. out. And oh, I, yeah. You went, yeah. wow, Doctor Who's but, not good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is what I thought was so funny about it. I, mean, I remember that when we were given Stephen's episodes, because we would all meet and have curries um, privately. The BBC are very, very strange. They don't like, because they're so secretive. I mean, my being here today would actually cause them to worry a bit. I, I used to have to go to conventions and announce my late on, I do not represent the BBC or any of their views. And no. I'm not, because that's literally what I have to do. I mean, they, they made you do that. You have to sign waivers before you did anything. Um, even now, I can't let them see my, my own scripts until. 2010, I think, is when the... I mean, it's quite, quite well, obviously true. Yeah, 2010. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a script of course, which doesn't have the Daleks in, because I wrote a new monster. Well, I think when we lost them, about a month, I wrote a story called Absence of the Daleks, which is terribly witty, um, with an entirely new monster, which will, I think, appear in season three now. So it's, although not written properly by me, but it's... You're saying that um, the second series, you've been the restraints move you're allowed to play a lot more with yeah. the, the darker brooding aspect and also the horror of it. Yeah. If you've been able to do dark series a season two story and, and make it dark and slightly more violent, would you maybe put in the series of matter along with the face? No, of I don't think so. I mean I think that I mean I'm quite happy with as far as Dalek goes. I mean Dalek actually when I wrote it she was a lot funnier. Because I'm really a comedy writer and my first draft of Dalek is a lot more like a black comedy. Um, originally, you don't get Van Staten, you get Van Staten's wife, actually. Van Staten's wife is the lead figure, and her husband is in this coffin, mutated into a Dalek, and she, she wants the Dalek to talk, because it's his birthday, she wants to say happy birthday to him, because it's just a toy to her. And, it, and that was, and that stayed from, I mean, actually, bizarrely, I and mean, if you actually watch the episode, the birthday thing is still there in one and I even though it doesn't have any function anymore, because that's survived for such a long time. And the characters were a lot more, the, the guards were a lot more sort of um, comically um, rubbish. Because the idea is if you actually have your own private army that don't do anything, they don't, well, they're just useless. Can't the board side of the yeah, that's right. Which, um, so early on, actually, and there were scenes filmed for it, where we've got the, the guards eating pizza. And he's like, oh, he's coming back in his helicopter now. 
and, 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 they're, and they're just very, very lazy because, because they're only being kept there as some sort of big indulgence to this man who... Yeah, I mean, you know, he's, he's just an idiot. I mean, he, he is someone who just wants to play with toys. Um, and so, if anything, actually, I would have liked to have seen more of that go back into it because I think that what Dark had to become because of the, the time constraints and because also that's what the BBC really wanted, it became a bit too much for me of an action packed, gun toting episode. Um, I wanted more of that sort of Doctor Who feel of people being a bit out of their depth. I did love the bit where he was going through all the old bits and pieces and sort of saying that. Oh, great! Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the only joke that survives from draft one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many jokes well, in the draft one. I loved it. And, and every single time the hairdryer came up, he said, oh, we'll leave it for one more draft. And, and, it, and it got filmed. And I mean, I'll do a commentary later. And I always cheer at that line because it's the only bit I can say, well, that actually survived an entire year's worth of rewrites. <laughs> Hair dry, yeah, but that, that was an early game. Oh, I've got a soft spot for the, oh, somewhere beginning with S. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that's by Russell. Um, oh, right. That came in very, very late in the day because I'd left Van Staten alive and in charge. And the BBC suddenly thought, well, actually, we'd better give him a come up on this. So they wrote all that stuff in, mm -hmm. uh, just fulfilment. I think it's fine, but it bothers me that he's still work guards. I thought they were all dead, mm -hmm. and he still got, and he's got some to take them away. So I mean, that's the only problem. With that. <coughs> it's quite funny though. It's a nice, that, book, that's why it's a nice bookend to the episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, close to that. Yeah, that's right. And this is you mentioned the Daleks' Happy Birthday. Just picturing that in my mind now. Well, that's, it's that Dalek blows the candles out and then blows the cake up. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same sequence though. But when the Dalek gets upstairs and and it turns on at that point, it would be Mrs. Van Staten. Says, do chain as you were then. So Gordon said, you know, you tortured me, what would you have me say? You know, you want me to talk, all right then, what, 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 what do you want me to say? And she says, is it happy birthday? And Julie Gardner woman just said, we can't have it say that, that's just so stupid. <laughs> and of course it would then have killed her. He said, nah, I'm not going to say that, and kills her. But, and it would have seemed, so, I, I think it would have been quite funny, but maybe funny was the wrong thing at that point. I don't know, I don't think what was Fans of sense of humor about these things. Yeah. Well, an advantage is that the, you can get a lot darker, provided it's got the humor alongside it. Well, well, there was a lot more death also by that stage. I mean, when we had, it was, we had entire sequences where dark splat lift charts and blow up bottoms of lifts and fat guards get trapped to the, you know, in, in the lift and then get vaporized so that I can, can actually fly through them. I mean, it's, it was horrible stuff. But it was too expensive, surprise, surprise. I mean, actually, that was the other thing about Martin Dyke, was they wanted to be these big action sequences. And they eventually really get really, I mean, I opted to keep the one where, where he electrocutes them, I suppose, other things, because that took a day to film that entire sequence. You can't do too many of those because it costs too much. So I said, well, let's just keep the one where he electrocutes. I said, OK, so we, since we lose the lift, we lose the sequences where it goes through ventilation shafts, we'll just keep the sequence where he electrocutes all the guards in one go, which is, I think, the best anyway, because it's quite clever now. I think it shows the dark to be quite clever. So. Thank you. I've missed the entire thing, I'm going to ask you questions now, but yeah. my only concern, I love the episode, for me personally, the best in the series. Oh, thank you. It is. isn't. <laughs> personally, it's, 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 it's set up to do for me. But the only thing I had a problem with, yeah. I felt the dark was just too good that powerful. A Dalek can absorb the entire Eastern Seaboard power grid. Also, yeah, but an army of them is somewhat redundant when one can probably <laughs> nuke the entire nation. That was the problem with the last episode, is that they went from being really powerful at the start to being weak at the end, didn't they? Well, that was my worry. Um, very early on, I said to... It was, that, it was that odd thing about it. I wanted the Dalek to be dying, you know, and originally there was no distress call, because I didn't want there to be one, I thought. It was actually Mal Young who said, isn't it a coincidence he just happens to arrive where there's trouble? And I said, well, that's the series, that's Doctor Who. He said, no, 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 we can't do that anymore, that's, that's just silly. So the distress call came in, and I was bothered by that, because I thought, well, if he's dying and weak, how can he send a distress call out? But no one really cares about that now. It was that difficulty, really, of trying to say, well, I mean, I wanted, originally, the I, my first draft had the Dalek underground, trying to get out, so he could send a signal to a mothership who would then decimate Earth. So the idea was stop him before he can actually get, it, get to the surface. And then Russell said, well, let's go with your last Dalek idea. That's a bit more fun. So that's when it began to become much more 
sort of iconic, these two last survivors. And at that point, I said, well, it's only a Dalek. And he said, it's a Dalek. You know, I mean, don't, don't be held back by the constraints of, of being a fan. This Dalek can wipe out before it's blown up itself thousands of people. It is a very, very clever strategist, and it, and it wants to kill people. If it gets outside, you might lose millions upon millions of people if it gets lucky. It, it, and that's what I wanted to say. It was, I mean, it, there's that whole sequence where he, where the doctor asks Van Staten what, what the nearest town was. And I was just trying to say, look, you know, these people are dead because they can't effectively beat this one Dalek yet. But my worry was, I said to Russell at the time, I said, you're bringing them back though, as an army in episode 13. Unless you make every single one of those Daleks as powerful as this, it's a little bit old. He said, no. He said, well, no one knows this. It's a different story. But for this story, you have to make the Dalek as powerful as you can because we need to explain to people why they're worth putting back in the first place. And that was the, the mandate. Um, and I enjoyed that, actually. I thought that, you know, I, I was tired of seeing Daleks being wobbly things people laughed at. You know, like Kit Kat ads. Yeah. I want to make them powerful. Even though it's supposed to be powerful enough to work out the entire race of time with us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other as well. You have to have that. Though. I mean, I know, yeah, I grew up with the wobbly bear, uh, the, the, the clones. I suppose beyond the magic of the Dalek being someone like a clone. It wasn't until I saw one of the, <laughs> actually one of the movies that I realised that there was a slime thing that crawled in. Yeah, absolutely. That's the first time I actually noticed about them. eventually we will destroy it, but at what cost it will wipe out things as long as it goes. Yeah. And it's like the Cybermen next year actually, the Cybermen are being reimagined, because you just need to approach them and say, well, yeah. if you just look at them all en masse, they always get, I mean, the Darks always lose. It's like the Master, he always loses. So the Master may be this ultimate evil genius, but we've never ever seen him do well. So how, important, how impressive can he really be? He always gets to be the Mother Doctor. So it was the idea of saying, well, the Daleks actually, even in part of the way, the Dalek actually wipes out continents. I mean, we don't just have a happy victory. And the whole time war thing um, means that you immediately say the Daleks are these terribly successful creatures who will wipe out entire galaxies. So one final one is going to be a big threat. And, and, and that was good fun. I mean, it was good fun actually to, to not... I mean, I, I met up with Eric Saywood as I was writing it, who had written the last, who'd written Peter and Colin Starling stories. And he was saying to me, but, but where's Davros? And I said, well, I haven't got Davros. I said, but you need Davros, because Dykes can't really function without Davros. And I, said, and I said, well, they have to try now. Davros is a great character, but if, if we can't set up the idea that the Doctor's nemesis can be as capable without their creator squawking around him, then they just become a little bit childish. Yeah, and I mean, that's right. Precisely. I mean, I mean I, I'm one of those, I'm very, very fond of Genesis and the Daleks, and I think that's a great, great story. But I do honestly believe that once you've got that character there, it does cripple the Daleks' effectiveness as monsters. I mean, I think the John Pope Dalek story is not that great either, overall, because they're a bit rudderless. I think Davos coming in did an awful lot to to get something back on track. But if you just see things like power, I mean, power of the Dykes is particularly what I was influenced by. The idea that, I mean, Dykes saying that, you know, one Dyke can wipe out this entire colony. But they're actually prepared to be cunning enough to pretend to be their servants. And I think that's great. I mean, whereas the idea we got over the 80s, 
And I'm an 80s Doctor Who fan. I mean, I was a huge Davidson fan, don't get me wrong, but the idea actually you get Daleks there is that Daleks are basically these drones that have no character or individual intelligence. And that, I thought, was rather a shame. I wanted that to be much more cunning than that. Yeah. So, do you think that, would you say that the use of the Emperor Dalek in the last story probably benefited the Daleks and, and the way they were represented better than having Davos here at that point? It could have been Davos, of course. I mean, if that, I think at some point there was talk about having him as Davos, but um, they wanted one big spokesperson at the end who was still <coughs> the I think that had they gone with Davos, it would have been very much Davos is, is the lead Dalek. Because it was, I, think, I think for some reason, it's the wiped out Davos would have no chance of being back. Yeah, that's right. I mean, obviously, at the moment, we have wiped out the Daleks forever. But, um, yeah. but I wouldn't hold your breath. I mean, I'm afraid. Wait for this season. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think that they'll be back fairly soon, actually. I mean, I mean, I, mean, I think that there's. But they were too popular, actually, not, not to come back. Well, they were playing um, the, the monster that actually keeps Doctor Who off. Yeah. It wasn't until it was when the first Dalek story came in yeah. that Doctor Who just went, shoom! Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, I'm ashamed to lose them. It's that thing, I'm, we're not really sure. Um, I mean, we brought back the Autons, but only as a sort of sort of handy way of having a contemporary Earth story. I, mean, I know that what happened with Rose was that Russell was wanting a, a very sort of quick, it's like coming to part four, the four part story for Rose. And he wanted there to be an Earth invasion, which is very, very contemporary and very ordinary gadgets. And was writing, and so we thought, well, it could be the Autons, it might as well be. Even though he doesn't use them as a main threat because it's not that sort of story, he said, well, if it exists already in the past and it's helpful to use it, we'll use it. With the Slavine, there was some talk at one point about him having the Zygons. But he said, but I, I don't want Zygons because Zygons actually have a classic of humour that, that I think Slavine had. He wanted Slavine to be these, these laughing, giggling children. And he thought that would be quite fun and different. But, but actually, in, in story terms, they have the same sort of function. They can take over people's bodies, and they can, I mean, they can disguise themselves as other people. So it could have been Zygons, but he had a reason not to do Zygons in the city. But beyond that, we've got Daleks and Cybermen, obviously, but I think they want to create their own monsters beyond that. I think that, I mean, you, you can do Sontarans, which or Sontramins, as Chris Eccleston used to call them, because he remembered those for some reason. Um, but you can do your own new race, which might possibly have a few more tricks up its sleeve. I think that what I felt with Doctor Who in the past was that you would have a terrific opening story for a new monster, and then it would never be as effective again. You know, you would have this great one where they established them, and then they would always be sort of also random people coming for the second or third story. I don't think the Sontarans ever were as effective as they were in Time Warrior, where you had this great, cunning, genuine character, again, one single Sontara, who was brilliant at things. And then they're all a bit dim after that. Eventually you get these Cockney ones in Invasion of Time, and, and the Doctor's ones, they just sort of walk around and are quite comical. And if they hadn't ever brought them back, that would be, you know, be a terrific character. And I think that... Therefore, Russell's trying very hard now to say, well, we want the side men because they're a brilliant idea. The Daleks, obviously, are, are what Doctor Who in some ways is represented by in, in the threats. But let's now find our own ones and bring them back. So, you know, I mean, I think that they are looking very actively to, to create long-running monsters now. Um, the same point about the Draconians, you know, probably. Because looking at modern sort of filming, the Draconians... Well, they look and Klingons are so very similar to look these days. Yeah. That they were good. The whole half of them. When they did it the first time, it was good. I just think today's technology, they could be fantastic. And they it's wrong. possible. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, Russell's great thing, actually, the thing which I like about Russell so much, is that I mean, Russell is a huge... I mean, Russell knows everything about Doctor Who. When I first wrote to thank him for getting me on board the series back at Christmas 2003, he wrote to me saying, oh, that's fine, Rob, marvellous, I'm glad to have you on board, but remember, we'll have lots of fun. But remember that I said that to you when we're stuck in a field in Cardiff, filming the Tar and Wood Beast scenes in your story, because that's what, what we might end up doing. The fact is that, you know, he, he was saying, let's bring out the Tar and Wood Beast as a joke, because they're so rubbish now, words of Tar. And that, I mean, Russell would never do that, 
but it's that sort of the fact that he knows every other monster. He, I mean, he knows the draconians very well. He knows the ice warriors, obviously. He knows he knows the plasmatons. Um, he, all we're trying to do now is to weigh up whether or not they would be very good in the story or not. And ultimately, he'll probably say, well. We have to start explaining them from the basics anyway. Let's let's start with our own ones, and we can do our own things with them. So, I mean, I think beyond Daleks and Simon, then probably, and, and you know, the all told little appearance in Rose, I wouldn't expect too many old monsters returning for, for the time being. Yeah, Could be that though. Well, obviously, I, I think that the uh, uh, Venom drugs are essential for the series. But I hope that they. Actually, he's, he has mentioned the Venom Browns. Is there any original monster you would particularly like to have a go at itself when you could pop? No, to be honest. I'd rather like to do something new. I, mean, I, I thought that the Daleks thing was... See, I, see I, I found Daleks very, very hard to do, because when we lost the rights to them, I got so jealous of everybody else writing their own stuff. You know, I, I gave Mark and Paul and Stephen a call that day. I was actually with Stephen at the time that I heard we hadn't got the Daleks back anyway. We're having a nice... Uh, lunch, got this wine out, and I was actually crowing over him because I had I, I'd finished writing pretty much Dark at that point. He hadn't even started writing into Charles yet, he'd been a bit behind. So I was saying, well, hell, you know, I, I've done my work now, and you've got, got it all ahead of you, Stephen, and my mobile phone went. And they said, oh, yeah, you, you could start again. You haven't got any anymore. You have to do a new story now. Um, and I remember spending the next month thinking, if I wasn't writing an old monster, I'd now be actually free to do whatever I wanted. And that's pretty much how they feel as well, I think. I think that the rights issues are so difficult with old creations that unless you actually actively need the darks of the side of it, which of course you do with those two, just do something new. And at least that, that, that becomes ours. And we can do with it whatever we want to without having to worry about the states. And because, again, with, with the Cybermen too, I mean, the Cybermen are also dead. It, it's actually, it's harder once you're dealing with some creations when they're no longer alive, actually, to deal with estates and agents. It becomes a rather trickier thing. Um, Terry Nation, I'm sure, would have been very excited about the Darwin story happening in the new series. But when you're dealing with only with, with business, it becomes a little trickier as opposition. When, when I heard they lost the Daleks, I went down. But I had this sneak suspicion. I had a sneak suspicion they'd come back. Because you've really got to admit, if you're not going to let Daleks go in Doctor Who, you're shooting yourself in the foot there. Well, I think I'll worry. Money. I think our worry as well was at that stage, the show hadn't been in the press very much. I mean, we had Chris and we had Billy, but that was it. And our first big news story was a, was a big negative. You know, Doctor Who's back next year. But without the Daleks. And he just looks back. I mean, I, I know the BBC head office was saying to the production team, get them back. I think we need them. We, we, we can't afford to say we can't get them. So, I mean, thank God they did from my point of view. I was, I mean, I was much happier going back to work once we got them back. But it was. You know, it's a good story that we probably came out with without them, but I'm happy that we got the Dark story. Do you think your story would be broken? I think the monster will, um, but it was Russell's idea the monster will. I mean, Russell and I sat down together and we came up with the concept. It was Russell's concept and my character. Um, the concept's great. Uh, it's a really good, fun idea. And I'm sure he'll use it. I mean, again, we had to take the same position in the series so that it would have been the thing which killed all the time bombs. It would have been, been this new creation. So it had to be a fairly big, important threat. And I think season three will shoot the scene. That's what we'll just say to Still, we'll use it in season three though. Now we've got a dark stack, that's fine. But um, the actual story I wrote is largely a dark. And I put it, um, after I wrote that, I put a lot of elements of that into the same story. Yeah, I mean, whereas previously, the story I wrote before that was actually very, very different. So the old episodes of Dark, or that point, Creature of Lies, as I call it at that point, uh, was actually quite different to what Dalek is now. I mean, those are, but I, I actually prefer the story I came up with for the, the non Dalek story. So when I came back, I said, well, let's clear all that away through these few jars. Let me start with this, but put a Dalek in it instead. I said, okay. So the early stuff is actually the stuff which is now most, most different. There are similarities, it was much more 
body horror arc in space stuff. Strange. What I did with the first few drums. With lots of black comedy in it. A bit weird. Do you think they'll bring back the masters? Yes, I do. But I don't know when. And it, it won't be this year. Um, I think that if, I think dramatically, if you say the last time Lord, what you're really saying is the dramatic payoff will be when he's not. It's otherwise you don't do it. And the master is the only one that is worth bringing back. But you don't bring him back unless it's a really, really good idea. Um, when the night, the night, when I can imagine the impact in say three years down the road to a new audience as well. The doctor meets someone from his own race, having established that they were wiped out right from the beginning of season one. That's a big dramatic moment. It isn't a dramatic moment unless you really make it pay off. And it isn't until actually you, you give it time to be one. Um, but Russell, I mean, I mean, he drops hints. I mean, he wrote that thing in the Doctor Annual, in which he said, Doctor, Thinks it's the only survivor, but somewhere on this mountain. Have you read this? There's this he's written this article in Doctor Who Annual, and, he, and he's such a team sponsor. He's written this thing where he says, Doctor Who, we're not just the last survivor of, of, the, of the time world, but somewhere on this planet with this huge mountain, there's this man writing in the mountain, You are not alone. And you read that, and you think, well, What have you done that? Because it, it's just a tease. I mean, I, I, I mean, one day Russell is basically saying by writing that, I'll, I'll bring them back, but just not yet. It's like, you know, if you bring back the Daleks and say it's the only one, dramatically you have to find a way out of that, because otherwise it's boring. I mean, we weren't going to really kill off the Daleks with just my story. So as soon as they said the end of the time once, I thought, yeah, for now. Because nothing in Doctor Who is ever permanent. So yeah, I think the Master isn't the one that they would bring back. I don't think it will be. Chancellor Goffal the Rani. But, um, but it, it, it won't be yet. I mean, there's a lot of speculation that actually Stuart Head is playing the master in the school reunion. But he's not. He's playing the headmaster in the school. But um, people still think he might be, but he really is. It's a great story, though. It has K9 in it. But it's still a great story, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that'd be good. Rumours have surfaced about the next series that the yeah. was was uh, putting actually before season two starts filming. I don't know if you've heard anything about this. Well, well, I mean, Billy's searching in all the season two. Right. Um, I, 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 and I think thank God for that, because I think that. I mean, I was very worried that. I don't think you could have Chris and Billy at the same time very easily. Mm -hmm. I think actually, strangely, but a new audience, Billy has become the person that they've actually latched onto more quickly than they have, say, Chris Eccleston's Doctor. I think at the end of season one, Billy said, well, I'm off now. And Chris had stayed on, it might actually have been in some ways a more dangerous thing. I think that Chris's story had played out, and now we want a more Doctorish Doctor who now takes it over the centre stage. But Billy is so wonderfully identifiable for so many people. Um, no, Rose is, is a huge part of the series. Rose is throughout season two. Uh, beyond that, I don't know yet. It's nasty in season one. It's all Doctor Who, you had Doctor and his satellites. Yeah. It was the first time the story was always told from Billy's, from Rose's point of view. The Doctor, Father's Day. Yeah. The Doctor actually did nothing except act as a catalyst. Help. He disappeared yeah. before the end. Yeah. But he was the catalyst, but it was Rose. And the whole series was Rose's point of view. Yes, that's right. And it was and, and the final final episode. We actually got to see for the first time an assistant that was the Doctor's equal. Yes. And you'd never seen that before, and it was a nice thing. But to it's see. also the way that the TV works now. Yeah. I mean, no television program now ever has one single lead. Yeah. I mean, they they did it in the seventies. Yeah. You, know, you, you would have it. You have tons of series actually, which had so and so was. Um, Love joy, or you'd have uh, shoestring, or whatever. But TV doesn't work now as having, I mean, everything has two leads. And you have to go into TV now, if you're doing television now, obviously, Doctor Who has to be Doctor Who and his companion, which is why the opening credits are Chris Eccleston and Billy Piper in Doctor Who. Uh, John Barrowman may be a companion, but he's not, he's not the lead in the same way that, that uh, um, uh, Chris and Billy were. What can you tell us about this new series? Torchwood. 
Not much. <laughs> I didn't know a thing about it. I, I, was, I, was, I was in Australia and they announced it and I thought, oh, that's a shock because I had no idea about it. I've heard things about it since because I've asked them. Um, but, I mean, it's going to be a much more... It's a different sort of series altogether. I mean, it's, it's, it, it has side fiction elements, but it's going to be a lot more character-driven, low-key, less special effect drama series, which can be a late-night show. I mean, not necessarily as the tabloids speculate, they're full of, full of lots of adult sex stuff, but it's going to be something which is a spin-off without having to feed back and Doctor Who too much. Um, there's, there are reasons for that. I think part of the reason is, is that you cannot, in BBC terms, be advertising a late-night post-Watershed show on a show which is meant to be designed in part for a children audience, because that's just unfair. Because what you're doing is you are risking corrupting kids. You can't say, okay, you've got all the eight models got to do, but this will all be explained if you watch Torture. Oh, and you can't. But you know, it's up anyway, maybe you can see it. So it has to be its own thing. I mean, there are elements, Torture will be first brought in because of Christmas Invasion, I think. I think there'll be Torture references. And it will set up there. And they'll be set up also, I think, in some of the more contemporary stories. I think that School Reunion, which I think is the next contemporary Earth story in the series, I think has, has Torchwood set up as well in there as well. But Torchwood has to be something which is separate, because otherwise you want to do some great, great legal things. I got the impression that when it was announced, they discovered John Barron. And he, when he came in, uh, he was slightly annoyed, but as you got to know, this character was amazing. Oh, this is the discovery. What do you say? I mean, John is a. Yeah. I've got the impression Ross yeah. has discovered this guy wants to do something with him, which is great. Well, John is a. I mean, John was. I mean, I mean, John's a lovely guy. I mean, John, he's a tremendous flirt. I mean, every time I saw that impression. Every time I saw him, he was with his hand on me, and I was saying, anyway, I must go and call my, my wife. And he's saying, <laughs> stay here with me, Rob. I said, no, I'm going to call my wife now. Um, he's, he's a lovely guy, John. He's also a huge doctor who fan. He went to conventions when he was a kid. I mean, you know, it's like David Tennant. I mean, he's, where was Billy and Chris worked? John was just thrilled to be there. I mean, he just loves Dr. Who so much. But he was only ever really brought in to provide military backup in parting of the ways. Um, you know, Russell said early on, we need that companion who can handle the gun. But I'll introduce him in Empty Child, and then we can leave him in part of the ways. I mean, that, that is his function. And he wasn't expecting him to be quite so popular or so successful, I think. And um, he's a great Captain Jack, and I think that Russell could still have brought him back, but doesn't want to dominate the TARDIS too much. He said he's actually too, too successful, and because he wants the series to be about that dynamic between the Doctor and Rose, Captain Jack sort of kind of spoils it. So give him his own series, and maybe in season three he'll come back, but he talked that's popular. He probably won't, he'll probably stay in the tour. So, um, I think it's great that they're doing stuff with Captain Jack, because he's... I mean, part of me at the time, I'll be honest, which they've killed him off, because when he gets shot in part of the ways, I thought, that is so unexpected and so dramatic. Because I watched it go out at the BAFTA, you know, the screen in there, I, I, and I have not read the script. So it was a big surprise to me all that happened, because I've never shown by this point. And he came back to life, I thought, oh, they put him back to life. But actually, I'm glad they did now, because of course he can now go on and do other stuff. But I thought, why bring him back? He's not going to come back at all. And of course, since there was no plans at that point to bring John back, I thought they'd be cool to be dead. So, one final one of the things that I noticed was when they did the Doctor Who movie, yeah. and it was that like, big, oh my god, the Doctor's kissed a woman. Yes. Yeah, there was nothing when Jack kisses Rose and the Doctor. There was nothing. Oh. I don't know. I don't know. I it wasn't the big. I didn't hear the big boom about it. Well, well I mean, you know, I heard a few booms about it. Um, I mean, there was some at the BBC exploded. <laughs> <laughs> the BBC loved it. The BBC didn't have a problem with that at all. But, but there were. I know a lot of fans who had an objection to it. I mean, they saw it as Russell's gay agenda. Um, the funny thing about Captain Jack was that was Stephen Moffat, who is who wrote Jack in and and Jack is pretty much Stephen's creation, the way that Jack is designed. A sort of great bisexual shagger <laughs> but, um, but that's actually Stephen Moffat, who is the straightest man in existence, saying, I, I, I want to try this character out. It's not even Russell's idea that so much. Russell just ran with it. 
So, um, John wanted to play that scene so that he felt that the doctrine rose with his and equal importance. Yes. It was like a big farewell thing. Um, strangely, I mean, I thought there'd be much more complaint from fans about the Doctor Rose kissing at the end of to take off the vortex. But actually, I was speaking to Ian Levine about it. It's very anti-kissing. He said, "No, no, it's, it's not a kiss. It's to absorb the vortex." And actually, I think that that's the, the cleverness of it. You actually have the people watching the series. This is the big romantic payoff to the entire year, yeah. which you do need in some ways, because it's been that way for 13 episodes. And Chris is now leaving, you've got to have, have the kiss. But for anyone else watching, if they want to say it that way, they can say, it's not a kiss, it's to absorb the vortex. And of course it is that as well. So after Mark, it's quite clever. after the whole series, and you can see that affection building up. It was yeah. it was a natural, whereas in the movie, and yeah. after years of Doctor, because it was still connected with the old series, it was just, well, where did that come from? That was completely useless. And again, fans... And it was there purely for Hollywood. I mean, fans, and I put myself as one of these, can say, well, it's post-regenerative stress, isn't it? He doesn't know what he's doing. He's just he's tapping the aspirin. Well, why has he done that? Well, he's just, he's just going through a regeneration crisis. Um, I think we can always find ways around it. I think the time that you get a situation where the doctor starts going out with a girl, that's when something's gone really badly wrong. But that would never happen while Russ was there. He doesn't want that. I mean, he, he says that the Doctor is, is basically this asexual character. And they're sharing cups of cocoa. Well, obviously, cocoa sharing. <laughs> I mean, but, 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 but not in bed, I think, is the important thing. It's, it's that thing where, again, it, it, it's worth knowing that if we started the show now from scratch, would we worry about it too much? And of course, what you'd have is that you'd want all that moonlighting, X-Files-like sexual chemistry without actually revealing it, which is what they did as well, so, until eventually they broke the series by doing so. And I think that we always wanted the idea that the Doctor and Rose were in love, but you wouldn't necessarily want to ever have them saying it or, or showing it, except as sort of we dead express it type way. Well, they alluded to it a number of times, especially when, Dalek, when, when, he came back, when they came back to Cardiff. Yeah. We had the second Slovene story and Rose and Mickey meet up. That's right. And it's, it's very much, look, I'm dumping you for this guy who sent me around the galaxy. Yeah. And Mickey um, also opened the title story and being immediately jealous of Captain Jack. I mean, all that sexual chemistry there is, I think, actually, uh, it's, it's actually pretty useful. Mickey coming back in the second series. Mickey, oh yeah. Oh. He would make good assistant. Um, Mickey's, well, you, yes, exactly what's, what's happening. I mean, Mickey's going to be travelling the TARDIS for a little bit, so, um, which I think he deserves. Yeah. He, he, I mean, he won't for the entire year, but he's going to be someone who... Mm -hmm. it was another good actor, one I'd seen before, I liked, in the Arvidas Empire. Yeah. But he really got to have a good character. He's a lovely guy, Noel, too. I mean, Noel's very, very... No, Noel's actually a writer. He writes screenplays. So he... Acting is like a secondary thing for him sometimes. It's not, it's not his main job. Um, but he's the nicest guy on set. And I think that Noel grew into the role. I think that, again, I mean, I first saw Noel in Rose. I wasn't that impressed, actually. I thought, oh, we've got more of him as well, haven't we? Oh, okay. But by the end of the show, I, I mean, at the end of the series, I, I've really grown to love him. And I think that, that, that Noel grew with, with the I think that Noel didn't necessarily know what he was doing at the beginning either. Because no one really did. It was such a rush, Rose. And there were so many mistakes in Rose that we would correct if we could now. Um, it's a good script, though, actually. Strange, I think it's a better script than, it, than some of the others around it. But it doesn't, it didn't quite come off. And I think that Mickey didn't quite come off. But I think by the time you read things like Boontown, I think Mickey is the best thing in Boontown, actually. And I think he's so good at parting of the ways. You know, because the way that he gives up Rose, I think, is beautiful. I think it's one of those really, you know, tear choking moments when he says, you know, you won't come back and you don't want to be with me, but all my I'll help you escape. It's great. I love that was show, showing how much he did love. Me. Yeah. It, well, it was it, in episode it, one. It we had this idea pretty much that he was just this useless boyfriend who didn't deserve her, which I think was the idea. The idea originally was, you know, when she leaves him, one of the time, he says, thanks. He says, what for? He says, well, exactly. And that is how it, I mean, he's meant to just be this sort of useless guy. And had he not returned, um, we'd had this idea of Mickey as just sort of idiot boyfriend. 
but he grew really well, I think. And I think that one of the things that was cut made under, which I think I have some regrets about, was the in the first draft of Aids of London, Mickey had had much more police problems as opposed to disappearance. He'd been put inside some cells because they thought maybe he'd murdered her. It was a lot darker and more troubled relationship as a result. But they held off on that a bit because they didn't want to go too far with that. Now we've got time for one more question. No? No, no, no. Uh, one point, I tell Russell, I wish he'd destroyed Cardiff, just as a person. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I do. And if, he's, if he wants to destroy a Welsh town, oh, I hope they do. Barry. I really hate telling oh, destroy Barry. I tell you, I'm <laughs> so sick of bloody Cardiff. I've been up and down all, all year. And, and I really hate Cardiff. Yeah. But it's, 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 it's a disgusting city. Tell him if he wants to destroy Welsh lives, destroy Barry. Yeah, well, I, I think Chris would, Chris, Chris would agree. I, I, I know that the most miserable filming was done on Barry, the Doctor Dances. No one enjoyed that. That was a really miserable late night on Barry. That was embarrassing. Yeah, and everyone hated that. I've always said if, if, if it's a terrible if place where you're going to start, they would start in Barry. Wales is the worst part. Oi, be careful there. I like Cardiff. 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 I like Cardi